Getting our online audience all online opinion edition. So when they sync up, we'll kick off. You ready? Thank you guys for joining us here today. This is our next event here in Southern California. We were in Los Angeles yesterday at the Perkins Cooley office with a great group of people. And glad to be here today with you guys here at the Entrepreneur facility here at uh, UC Irvine. And so I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Tank Capital is here. We are a company based out of Austin that was originally called Texas Entrepreneurs Network, but changed our name in 2016 when we went national. And at heart, we help form capital for the startup ecosystem. And one of them is helping startups raise funding from investors, which we're going to do today. And so we have a few slides to go through to explain who we are and what we're doing. So we're going to kick off those slides here in a second. And as we do, we'll first uh, announce some of our sponsors. The Expert Dojo was helping us with this program. Tech Post Angels, there, a couple of them are online. Dave Freeman is there with us and Richard Sudik. Uh, we also have Pitch Force. We have Max uh, uh, Shapiro of Pitch Force online as well today. Uh, Vishal Aurora of Vidash is also online with us. And then Jordan Wabe of Silicon Valley Venture Group. And yesterday we were at Perkins Cooey and then they were at UC uh, Irvine. Thank you guys for joining us today. And with that, let's go ahead and look a little bit about Tin Capital and where we came from and how we're doing here today. So this is our agenda. As you can see, we're going to kick off here around one o'clock, go through the first agenda after four presentations. We're going to take a break. Everybody's got a QR code there. We're going to use that to capture people's interest in what they're doing. And if you, uh, you know, the QR code's not working for you, we have paper forms to fill out as well. Then we'll, after the break, we'll come back and we'll do another four, and then we'll have closing remarks, and then we'll go to uh, Eureka, which is just on the other side of that building over there. We'll walk over and have a happy hour at the end to get to know each other more. So with that, so as I said, Tin Capital helps startups and investors connect for funding. And we do things like help we get the campaign ready, get the fundraise ready, uh, coach people on the pitch, and help make introductions, do a lot of email marketing to find investors. Then we do online, in-person, and dinner events to connect people together. This is an in-person event that we're doing here today. And we also do other things such as we help build diligence reports, build analyst reports, and other tools to help start to raise funding. Uh, in a, this is our current team. We are actually have expanded a little bit. We have hired five more people that we haven't got on the screen just yet. We've just been working on bringing them on board because uh, we keep expanding. We need more people to help us with the programs that we have here today. In addition to helping start to raise funding, we also help angel groups find members. We're working here with uh, CPAN in Austin, Gretsu, uh, Mid Atlantic Bio Angel, Bay Angel, Metro Angel comes here, Tech Coast. All these groups we've helped find members for their group. We see a lot of individual investors out there, and they need to be connected in, or they'll do better if they're connected into an angel group. And so that's what we do is we help foster uh, angel groups. So, second, we help VC funds find limited partners. Those who are running VC funds are often looking for LPs to come into their fund. And we do this primarily through family offices. We help them connect to family offices so that they can get uh, more money in. And family offices, unlike institutions, will actually fund first time managers or emerging managers. So, they're very instrumental in getting new people into the venture capital ecosystem. And then finally, we help high net worth individuals start family offices. And we do this with in person and online family office panels that we hold around the country. We've been doing this in New Mexico for the last uh, four years and have had great success with it. We've got over 30 family offices, there's really 175, and we've been able to service them and get them to come together to do some very interesting things for the local community. We are doing this physical panel in Austin and in Dallas and in the Bay Area and in New York. I'd love to do that here as well. We were talking to the Tech Coast Angels about that yesterday. So those are the different things that we offer in the market as well. 
So if you are currently raising funding and you're looking for help, you can scan the code and we'll get you on the list and we'll kind of talk with you about our program for what we're doing there. So you're welcome to learn more about our program and how we can help you get up and going. Uh, with that, these are the codes we'll use this afternoon. Don't worry, uh, we'll have them on the card there you can use later to uh, connect in and give us some feedback on each of the startups because they really value the feedback and the interest you may have in funding. The next thing we have is what's called the our AI chatbot we launched about six months ago. We have a podcast program. And part of that podcast program is a micro podcast called uh, the Startup Funding Espresso. And the time it takes to drink an espresso, you want to something about startup funding and investing. Started this about five years ago, and I was putting out one a day. Today we have about 2,000 of these, and having put them out one at a day, we're trying to figure out, well, how do we get this out to the audience in one go? And when AI came along, the answer was, put this behind a chat box. So go to this website, and go to the bottom right corner, click on the button. You can put in a prompt, ask it a question, how much money should I raise for my $2 million revenue company? That's growing at 20% a year, and it'll give you a synthesized answer of how much you should raise to order to keep your capital going. And you can ask it any other question. So it's basically all of chat GPT behind it. So you can get, if you ask it a very detailed question, it'll give you a very detailed answer. And tell you anything else you want to know about startup funding and expressing, because it's searching all of the espressos that we put together over the years, as well as the database that we have. So the history of us is I started angel investing in 2001 because I worked for a company that went IPO and had so much fun with it. I said, well, you know, it's, it's hard work finding the deals and doing the diligence. So I was looking for an angel group to start and I joined CCAN and then mm -hmm. months later I became the director of CCAN. So then I helped put that together, got 50 investors uh, signed up, got 5 million invested in 20 deals and we got two home runs out of it, 35X and a 40X home run. And then they went on to have good results as well. Then I helped Baylor University start an angel network and found that that was a great way to get investors connected back to their university and get students uh, exposed to the startup ecosystem. Something we might want to consider here is if we want to get more angel investors connected to UC Irvine, you can actually help them. They can actually help their startups get more funding and more coaching going through. Uh, and so in 2016, we started getting calls from outside of Texas wanting access to our network. So we changed the name to Ken Capital, which Ken stands for. And we started doing our program around the country before the pandemic. But then today, we came up with a better logo and have expanded our program to do a lot more with response to uh, helping angel groups and VC funds and family offices. So the program continues to grow and develop, but it's fundamentally about uh, forming more capital for startup uh, activities, is what it is. Uh, we do these events. We do events in online. Pandemic put us all online. Today, we still have five online events per month with groups. Uh, we also do in-person events, primarily this road show that you see here. We'll be in 13 cities this year. Next year, we'll probably be in 20. Uh, so we continue to expand that out. And then we also do dinner events. One thing you'll find is that the world wants to start on Zoom with the introduction. And while that's easy to start the discussion, uh, the mistake is to think that you're going to close the funding or discussion on Zoom. You probably will not, because the key with fundraising is you have to demonstrate it, the growth story, and you have to build a little bit of a relationship with the investor. And Zoom does not do that all so well. So for closing, we get investors back together for dinner events. And dinner for two hours, go through every slide the deck, answer every question, and then you have a much better shot at closing. So it's a mistake to think that uh, I'm going to send an email out and get a million dollar check back. But that's, that's what we spend all the day doing is to say, well, we have to get out and close, and it, it, is, it is a thing to do for sure. Uh, you check out our events. If you go to Tim Capital website, you can actually see all the events that we have coming up. It's quite a few that you can connect with. And then this is where we're going for the road shows. You've seen where we've been. We're now here in LA, Orange County, on our way to New York City, DC, Houston. We're going to do another pass at the Bay Area as well. And then on to other cities next year. And then we have a podcast program, uh, Veteran Connect, that started in 2013. We've done over 800 interviews with angel groups, DC funds, uh, family offices about how they invest and why they invest. We put that together to institutionalize the knowledge of, a, of an angel group and what they do and how they can be more effective. And then the Startup Funding Festival we talked about already. And finally, we have a mentor advisor program. If anybody wants to advise or Mentor companies, we have a way to connect with companies to do that. So, Minneapolis about that. 
And again, I want to thank our sponsors here, Expert Dojo, and many of you guys are online with us, Richard uh, Sudik and uh, Dave Premier from the Tech Coast Angels are up there, official lead officers up there. George Wabe has been a great support for us as well. I want to thank those guys for joining us. So with that, uh, we'd like to recognize a few people. Tina John, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tina John. I'm from San Diego. I'm a biomedical engineer and founder and CEO of Feeder Up, uh, which is a uh, new product in the breastfeeding space for women and infants. And I'm um, having a great time with my first event here at the Capitol. Great. And that, next is Ruby. Oh. Hi. Oh. hi, everyone. My name is Ruby Mejia. I work here at the UCIS Junior Center, where we help give a lot of resources, bring a lot of uh, community members into like our space, and we just provide all these resources for our undergrad students. Great, thanks. So with that, I think we're ready for our first pitch. So if we could go ahead and bring up Vertio Help, Arjun, come on, and have you kick off. Each one gets ten minutes to pitch, five minutes Q and A. Thank you for doing the time. Oh, you want to click her? Take one. Take one. Is it here or there? Uh, it should be over there. One more. Keep going. One more. One more. There it is. All right. Uh, Paul, thanks for having me again. Uh, I'm getting to know you too well, I think so. Uh, thank you, everyone, for not coming here today. It's very your help. We're transforming physical therapy for everyone. And so what does everyone mean? Physical therapy has a major problem. And part of it is that in the U.S. alone, there's about 100 million adults uh, that have MSK issues on an annual basis. Only about 15 to 20 million of them they can make it to a PT clinic. Um, so that means there's 80 million Americans that are walking around in pain, uh, not getting treated. And what does, what does that lead to at some point in time? Surgery, which is not cheap. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one is obviously cost. Uh, PT is not expensive in Santa Monica. One PT session costs about $220. Uh, and about $60 of that is copay, depending on what your insurance is. So you go for 10, uh, you know, PT sessions, you're talking about 600 bucks. Uh, yeah. For a lot of people, that's okay, but for, for some, absolutely not. From a company perspective, 75% of uh, companies in the U.S., uh, their MSK spend is the number one spend that they have for healthcare. That obviously impacts their premiums downstream. Second is time. Go for a P I've been for PT, I, you know, I love to run, have knee issues at times. It takes a couple hours every day just to go for PT. Second thing is that for employees, uh, they miss on average 10 workdays a year for MSK issues, with back pain, knee pain, whatever it might be. And what that leads to is there's a host of people that never make it for PT, and the ones that do make it for PT, 76% of them stop before the session, before the uh, Regimen is over. And part of the reason is once your pain is gone, you don't go back anymore. And I'm guilty of that process as well. So, so what are we doing? We're an end to end software platform. Our target market is not uh, consumers, our target market is organizations. So it could be you know, state agencies, it could be companies, and we're targeting their employees. And so we sell to organizations and their employees come on our platform. The first thing they do is they often fill in their medical information. They get to meet physical therapists and that physical therapist will give an assessment to them and then provide them with a recovery plan. From there onwards, the physical therapist doesn't need to interact with the patient. Uh, there's a care team that's structured. They interact with the patient, but the software monitors your entire progress. And as you do exercises, the software tracks what you're doing. And if there's any issues, intervention required, or somebody's having a hard time with exercises, the software knows that's happening and notifies the care team. The care team can take care of the problem. So what have we done to date? We've spent about three and a half million dollars building our technology. And there's a couple of components to that. So one is computer vision. Uh, it's it's tough. Uh, everybody tell you, you know computers can see everything. Well, they're really bad. You can put a you know, code on a chair and it'll think it's a human being because it doesn't know the difference between arms and legs. It just thinks that the shape is the same, it's going to identify it. So there's a lot of things that we have to do to make sure the accuracy is much better. Second thing, we've gamified the process. So we've built augmented reality on top of computer vision. So now when you're doing an exercise, you're actually getting rewarded as you, one of the, as I said, the biggest thing is 
that people stop doing. So how do you motivate them? What do you do to make them feel better? And so we give a it. So what we do is we put targets on the screen. So you can you can use your laptop, you can use your tablet, you can use your mobile device. As you do an exercise, so let's say you do a squat, you'll see a line around your knee. So that's the maximum extension you have. But in physical therapy, the maximum extension may not be the same for a patient coming on now based on their pain versus what's going to be in six weeks. The other second portion, we want them to be rewarded every time they move. So when they when they touch something, they see animation on the screen and they hear sound. But then they get used to that, the brain gets used to that. And there's other components from behavioral science perspective that we're doing. And at the back end, what we're doing is we're, build, we're building a recommendation system. So we know the patient's profile, age, uh, you know, height weights, what their pain levels are. And we can monitor what these protocols are. So what exercises they're doing, what they respond to, what's easy for them, what's hard for them. And that gets fed back then to, as we get more data, because we just, we're early stage right now, free revenue. We start uh, generating revenue in Q4 of this year. Uh, <clears throat> so as we get more information, more data in, we're able to better recommend what protocols should be there. So what does that lead to? It leads to cost savings for patients, for the employers. It leads to time availability, because what, if, you do, if you complete your physical therapy, you reduce your uh, time out of the world for about 50%. And then obviously from a patient's perspective, all they need to do is, you know, four or five days a week, they do 15, 20 minutes of exercises. Now they could do more if they wanted to, but they do that minimum and they're progressively getting better. End result, using gamification, all the studies, we're going through a pilot program right now, but all the studies prove that you're twice as much do it if you motivate and you motivate their brain to do exercises. So what's our go-to-market plan? Uh, we've got really two components to it. One is obviously direct sales, so we sell to enterprises. Our first target market is self-insured uh, self employers. So there's about 33 million employees in the U.S. that work for self-insured employers. There's a direct benefit for them. You know, they, let's say they're paying fifteen hundred to thousand dollars for physical therapy, depending on which geographic market you're in. Not cost them five hundred dollars. So there's a thousand dollars saving per episode of physical therapy. Second is insured companies. So, that, so there are now uh, CPT codes around reimbursement for remote therapy monitoring. Uh, and that leads to the next two, which is insured companies or accountable care organizations, which are large doctor groups. We're working with one group that's called Privia, that is the third largest ACO in the US, with about 2,300 providers. And final would be once we have traction to go off the payers. Partnerships, the two that impact the most, third party administrators. So they're the ones that that actually run the plans for self-employed companies and then help benefit brokers. They're the ones dealing with HR, doing the organization, telling them what they should be doing, what they should do. So we just started our commercial activity in June of this year. So we spent a lot of years just building our core technology. We just signed on Monday, Novell Group there in, uh, in, in Southern California, construction company. Uh, <clears throat> Meritain is their, their uh, TPA. Meritain is part of, uh, of Aetna, is their uh, TPA. And then we're dealing with Hubbard National, who is their benefits managers. We're building relationships with both of those. We're in the final phase of negotiating a contract with Plains Doc. Plains Doc is an umbrella organization that gets smaller uh, self insured companies together. They have over 100,000 employees with different companies that are under their, under their plan. Uh, we're in the final phase of uh, being able to deal with them. So they'll, they'll be coming online shortly. And then I mentioned Privia, we're doing a part of them. And then we have an active pipeline uh, that we are targeting. So how big is the market? Uh, MSK spend is the largest spend for any disease in the US in healthcare. One hundred six dollars is spent on MSK. Now, grant you that about 65% of that is spent on surgery. So the question is, that needs to be reduced. How do you reduce that? Making sure that patients do their physical therapy, build their muscles correctly, build, build their range of motion correctly. So massive market in the US, massive market worldwide. So we're not the only players in this space. Uh, there's a bunch of companies, some, some pretty big. We believe our investment has given us about a two year head start on them with computer vision, augmented reality gamification, and the behavioral science components that we're doing. Uh, season management team. Uh, so this is my third startup, uh, my first startup at the public. Uh, it, was a, it was a software technology uh, startup. Uh, Ty Bordner, who's running our sales and marketing organization. Ty worked with me in my first startup. I've uh, known him since, since college. 
He, after that, company went public. He joined other startups and was part of management team that went public. And then we have a great medical and physical therapy team, uh, board advisors, active members that guide us on because our backgrounds are software. What our targets are, we've got a small revenue target for Q4 of this year with about $5 million in revenue in 2025 and about $56 million in revenue in 2027. So our key drivers are obviously finding employers with large enough faces. So you find you know, an employer with 10,000 know, employees. Now you've got 10,000 people. Obviously all of them are gonna have problems. So maybe 10, 15% of them are gonna have problems, but that's, that's what comes on with the single sale. Our sales cycles will range between you know three months to six months, depending on the size of the organization itself. Like everybody else, so we expect you know to hit eighty-five percent growth margin once growth profit once we are you know a couple of years out uh, with about thirty percent plus EBITDA. Our two KPIs are basically how many uh, you know patients can a single physical therapist bring to the pipeline. So we are estimating you know uh, that. 175 patients, and then you know the, 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 how many patients do we treat on an annual basis? Because that will drive the revenue. We've got three buckets in that. Uh, uh, hold on. Okay. Six minutes. Six. All right. So, uh, so, so, so you know the biggest thing is how many patients can we treat through it, and obviously how many patients can we bring to the, to the pipeline. Uh, and then final thing, uh, we're, we're doing a $700,000 raise right now using a safe note with a $7, $7 million valuation uh, post on the cap. Uh, we've raised $240,000 so far out of that. And our spend is for obviously ongoing operations and bringing on some sales people because right now there's a whole host of us that are very multiple hands. With that, I will open up for questions. On the first question. Go ahead. So you need to talk about your IP. Do you have any IP? Yes, we do. Uh, okay. So so we built we built a multiple layer. So one is obviously computer vision that we have. The second is augmented reality. So we built basically an engine that runs on all the platforms because obviously you know physical therapy is about thousands of exercises, and so that's so so what it does is it actually there's no programming required for that. We define what the exercise is going to be. All the events are defined. Everything is defined, and the engine reads it. That there's a lot of work that's put into that to be able to do that from an offensive reality perspective. So, so those are the two key components that we have within our application computer vision and when we AR we build on top of that. Is that a hardware as a service? No, it's, it's all software. There's no so we use your regular devices, so phone, tablet, so there's no hardware, it's not hardware required. So we're using the camera on the on, on the device, on the laptop, on the phone, tablet to monitor your progress. So what we do is we we record your joints. So basically, you know, where your joints are and how the joints are moving. Because that's what is critical. Now that information gets fed back to the care team, and the care team can actually automate, uh, animate that process and see without capturing video of the patient itself. How do you refer a patient to the narcotics side? So obviously, I mean, the only thing you can do is give, give them instructions, right? At the end of the day, so every exercise, so they can watch a video of how the exercise is done. During that video, they get told, you know, stop if you're feeling pain. And don't, so you can't, the, beyond that, there's nothing else you can do. So are you able to replace outpatient visits to the physical therapy yeah. office? Like for instance, six weeks post-op after you visit? So, 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 so here's the process. So the first thing that happens is you do a telehealth call with the, with the therapist and they make a decision basically whether we can treat from the platform or not. Uh, so there are people that, you know, so, so we had a, uh, we're in the pilot right now, one of the patients was, yeah, when I stand up, you know, quickly, I can, you know, basically get where we go and fall down. We're like, okay, no, we don't want to teach you in the platform, on our platform because that's high risk. So it just depends on what it is. But the expectation is 75 80% of patients that have any MSK issue can be treated on the patient. It's about the 20 25% that need to go in, in person therapy. Yes. So let's say a patient has visited the uh, today, right? Mm -hmm. You have, or whatever, six months, whatever period. And let's say they get injured again, like three years, same thing. Mm -hmm. Is there like a, do you guys have like a continuity of 
Yeah, so so we have all the information. Obviously, we, we track all that and, and a stage profession. So so the expectation is that patients that are coming on our platform be treated. Their treatment ends within ninety days. Now, once you get post surgery for ACL and things like that, then you know that is much longer. But the expectation is ninety days. So let's say we go back and then you know you're lifting something heavy, and you know six months later you recycle back to the program. You get a, another assessment, and then okay. it could be the same program or something else. Okay. Okay. Else, thank you. That is for medical. So again. Very good. Uh, my name is Michael Cormick, and I'm the president of Corin Medical, and we are focused on the early diagnosis of peripheral artery disease, or PAD. So you may wonder, gosh, why are we focused on PAD? The images on your left, those disturbing images, uh, are affect over 100,000 people every single year, and they progress from leg pain to the middle image, which is chronic limb-threatening ischemia, and unfortunately, 150,000 patients every year have an amputation related to PAD. It affects 12 million Americans every year. It has a 33% mortality rate. It can lead, it's a progressive disease that can lead to lower limb amputation. And the healthcare system is spending $250 billion annually. But many of you probably haven't even heard of PAD before. That's the reason I give you this image off to your right here that compares it to cancer. We all know cancer. Gosh, if you got a diagnosis of cancer, it's scary. Everybody gets scared of that. The mortality rate for cancer within five years, all forms of cancer is 25%. If you're diagnosed with peripheral artery disease, it is a 33% mortality rate within five years, so it's higher than all forms of cancer. But the good news about this is per, uh, peripheral artery disease is preventable with early detection. And doctors do have a couple of tools for early detection. You see them pictured here on your left. The one on the top is the gold standard. This is what's outlined in medical guidelines and it's what's reimbursed by CMS. It is a Doppler ultrasound. It looks like a pencil probe, and they use it to find arteries, one in the arm, and you have to find two in the leg, one in the top of the foot and one in the ankle. Uh, that's where it's challenging. You have to be a certified vascular technician in order to find those vessels. And when you talk with those folks, they're doing many of these a day, and they know as soon as the patient walks in the door, how frustrating it's going to be to find those vessels in their feet. So it's a very time consuming process. Right below it is oscillometry or plasmography. Many of you had this done on your arm. It's a blood pressure, automatic blood pressure. That works great. It's very easy to use. However, it lacks accuracy for a uh, pad diagnosis because it can't find two vessels in your leg. Therefore, because of that suffering of accuracy, it's not reimbursed by CMS. So the only one that's reimbursed is the Doppler. My uh, chief technology officer, who's an ultrasound expert, came to me and he said, gosh, this pencil probe has been the same for the last 25 years. They haven't changed it. Even though it's been a lot of improvements in ultrasound, most of it imaging ultrasound, there hasn't been in Doppler-based. And what we do in Doppler-based, the difference between image and Doppler, Doppler sings pings down trying to find red blood cells. It's like trying to find a submarine from a ship. You're sending a ping down, one comes back. So that's what we're doing, but they're finding red blood cells. It hasn't been innovated in the last 25 years from the, the, the Doppler pencil probe. And so what we've done is we've come out with a multi-element Doppler probe that has many of the crystals, not just two, and it automatically locates the vessel. It's going to reduce the time of testing from an hour down to only 10 minutes to be able to find the vessel. So it's much quicker. Uh, we also boost weak signals. So we amplify sounds that others can't. Everything is if you can hear the blood vessels and we, we amplify that sound so that they can hear it. And we also have an AI diagnostic algorithm that helps interpret the results for physicians. Our technology comparison compared to the market leaders, ultrasound is what's in the market today uh, with the legacy Doppler. And we are much better than that in that we automatically find the vessel. You don't have to search on the surface of the skin. So we make it much shorter. Oscillometry and plasmography are what's available today, but they're very easy to use. They're just not reimbursed and they don't follow medical guidelines. We patented what we're doing. Uh, we weren't the first ones to ever think of a multi-element crystal array, but in this application, we're the first ones to apply it to peripheral artery disease diagnostics. 
And therefore, we have key claims around our multi element growth and how we find those arteries. The American Heart Association is very focused on peripheral artery disease. And the reason why is if you're diagnosed with peripheral artery disease, it is a higher indicator that you will die from coronary heart disease than if you've had a previous heart attack. So PAD is the number one indicator that you will die from, cor from coronary heart disease. So they're very focused on it and it's all around education, uh, making sure that patients and more physicians understand the uh, harms potentially of peripheral artery disease. So they have a PAD collaborative, they have a national action plan centered around education. They just published new PAD guidelines that's calling for more testing, earlier testing. The way to solve this problem is find it early we can manage it if we find it early. Uh, they also, the AHA picks 10 companies every year, startup companies that they think can improve healthcare. Uh, we were very fortunate last month to be one of those 10 companies that was selected uh, to work with the American Heart Association. And it's because of the potential impact of our system to be able to diagnose PAD in a much more efficient way and accurate way than what's being done today. The market opportunity is huge. The, the total available market is 1 million patients. The American Heart Association publishes today that everybody that's over 65 years of age or people with diabetes that are over 50 should get tested for PAD every year. Most 65 year olds have never been tested for PAD. Only 20% are actually being tested today and that is the SAM and the SUM. The SUM is the US only. That's where we'll focus first. There's 113 million tests per year in the U.S., and that's done by specialists. It's done by a cardiologist. It's done by vascular specialists. If you're seen by a primary care, they don't employ somebody that does this test because it takes 45 minutes to do it. It's impractical to do it in primary care. That's why they're referred to specialists. A lot of patients will fall through the cracks there. They won't go to the specialist. They just think it's old age, and so they don't go and get diagnosed. So what we'll do is we'll first convert this market because we have an incredible value proposition in terms of making it much easier to do that test. And then we will move toward moving that screening toward the primary care office because we can do it in less than 10 minutes and you don't have to have a specially trained person to do it. Our business model will be software as a service. We'll charge $500 per month for the lease of our system and across a three year horizon, it's got over an 85% margin. When we commercialize, we'll partner with some of these with one of these big companies. We started conversations with them in Q4 of last year. When you're dealing, with, I've had three conversations with Medtronic, then a couple of conversations with BD. You have to start early. They want to see your milestone production over time in order to partner with you. So we have had multiple conversations with them. We also have an operations uh, company that we're working with that's helping us with our manufacturing. And we got some great partners in the University of Minnesota for ultrasounds, they're ultrasound experts, and the University of Texas Health Science Center for medical and clinical expertise. In terms of our commercial strategy, how will we launch the product? We're gonna launch the product, first off the American Heart Association, again, they're very focused on this thing, on this area. They give us a heat map of the United States and it shows where are our PAD amputations the worst. The dark areas are where most of them are. So we have partnered with the University of Texas Health Science Center in one of those worst areas and the University of Mississippi Medical Center. They've helped us design our system and they'll be the first launch sites that we'll go to. As I mentioned before, we'll first start in the existing market and we'll convert to cardiologists and the vascular specialists with a system that's more accurate and much more efficient to use. Uh, can be tested a lot faster. And then we will move it to primary care and we'll sell our value proposition around accuracy of our system, the efficiency of the system, reducing the testing by 70%, accessibility, allowing anybody to test. You don't have to be a certified vascular technician and coverage. We're covered by CMS current CPT codes. In terms of our financial projections, uh, we'll submit to the FDA late this year and we'll get commercial approval in the first half of the next year. We have revenues that are coming on board and you'll see in 2026, guys, we hit profitability in 2026 with 6% penetration of the existing market. That's not any conversion of the larger market, just the existing market. So how do we build this? The way we built our revenue projections actually did it on a bottom-up basis. In talking with BD and with Medtronic, they have 100 reps in the field. 
So they have 100 reps that are selling to cardiologists and vascular specialists. We forecast the 1.5 units per month per rep, and that's how these revenues will go so from a bottom up perspective. And then we checked it on a top down perspective in terms of penetration. Uh, in terms of the ROI for the customer, how does this work for them? Now, the reimbursement from CMS is $87 per test. So per PAD screen, $87. They have to do six tests in a month to pay the $500 lease fee that we have. When you think of cardiology offices or vascular specialist offices, they usually have three physicians. Those three physicians have at least five to 600 patients that are coming through every single month. And 25% of that patient group will need a PAD test. So they've got well over 100 that need a PAD test. So it certainly pays for itself. In terms of our uh, leadership team, we have, uh, I've got an outstanding group of executives. Uh, a lot of us worked together before. This is my fourth startup. So I've taken two companies public uh, and I've worked with a number of these executives before. David Lerner is the brains behind uh, the innovation that we brought to Doppler Pencil Pros. And then in terms of our advisory team, we have an outstanding group of advisors, particularly our medical advisors and Dr. Abini, who's at the University of Minnesota, that's an ultrasound expert. In terms of our capital requirements, uh, with Founders Capital, with Founders put the first $578,000 in. And what we did with that, we were able to reach proof of concept and we got patent pending status. After we reached that, we started raising a round of capital. It's $1.5 million, it's a convertible note, 20% discount, and 10% interest convertible into Series A. Um, we have an evaluation cap of $7 million and we're available to, for the Minnesota Angel Tax Credit, which is 25%. We do have a lead and we've closed on 370,000 of this. And then this last slide here just kind of gives you our value creation milestones since inception. So it was in 2023, that was the first year of operations for the company. We were able to reach uh, proof of concept and get patent pending status. This year we will submit to the FDA. Next year, we'll get FDA approval and we'll start commercializing. In 2026, we'll hit cash flow positive. And in 2027, we'll launch our second platform, which is for Venus insufficiency. Everything underneath the probe, we can hear. You can directionally listen to flow going away from the heart or to the heart. Away from the heart is what we're listening for today, which is arteries. To the heart is veins. Venus insufficiency is easy for us to diagnose, and it's a huge market that be our second platform. And then across the bottom is some of the awards and honors that we will receive this year. Most notable, obviously, the American Heart Association partnership that we have, which is just outstanding for us. So at that, I welcome any questions. Yeah. Um, so initially when you started, I thought it was gonna you're gonna go directly to consumer, but so what's the value proposition between the current Doppler and what you're doing? Is, is it just easier to use to find um, the, the, the pump, I guess, the artery? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'm glad you answered. Let me give you a little bit more nuance in how they do it today, because I think you appreciate it even more. So certified vascular technicians use a pencil probe today, and they have to find two arteries, on the one on the top of the foot and one on the side of the ankle. And those are the difficult ones. The one in the arm is really easy to do. It's the one in the feet. So what they do is that they will see patients, they have this frustration every day. Patients come through the door that are very obese or very swollen or have really bad flow. It's incredibly difficult. You're taking this pencil probe and you're moving it on the surface of the skin. Everything has to do with the angle. You got to get the angle right so you can hear whatever flow is there. So once you get the angle right, now you got to hold your hand in exactly that position and you push a button so it inflates a pressure cuff. Everybody's had blood pressure before. The cuff acts as a tourniquet and stops the flow. So the blood flow goes away. You don't hear it anymore. Now it slowly releases the air. We're all used, we've all had this. And what you're listening for is when it comes back. If it doesn't come back and they don't hear it come back, then they know what they did is they moved the angle of their hand and they have to do it again. For these patients, if anybody's ever had one of these cuffs on your calf, it is not like on your arm. It's incredibly painful. So it's very frustrating and it's very painful for the physicians. What we do is we automatically find the vessel and we lock into it with our automatic array. So when you hit the button, it doesn't lose it. It's locked into that vessel. Yes, the flow goes away. That's what the tourniquet does. 
but it's locked into that same area. So it's much more accurate, it's much more uh, time efficient for the patient, and it, it'll give a, a much quicker test too. All right, Paul, uh, yeah. how long before FDA approval? You said you're gonna apply this year, sir, and how long before you get that? It's a 90 day review, so we are a class two device. We're a 510K without clinicals that are required. We won't be the first ultrasound device. There's many of them. They have a test regimen that's already established for it. So we're in that testing mode right now, doing all of those FDA required tests. Uh, we should get approval in the first half. Yes, we've allowed a little bit more time than the 90 days, but you always have to do that. Thank you. You bet. Yes. Have you got patients to go for treatment for patients that will make the procedure uh, moving all back insulation and whatever? Yeah, excellent question. So uh, the first question about no flow or you can't, there's a couple of conditions that happen commonly. So one is they have no flow, so you can't find anything at all. Um, obviously there are a couple of other steps that you can go to. You can move to segmental, so you can move to a different part of the lake. We can obviously do that. And then there's also the toe brachial index that you could move to also and see if you can pick it up in the toe. And we'll have a toe application also. These are more rare conditions, but yes, you've got to have both. Another situation where you may find flow, but you can't get it stopped. It's because the vessels are calcified. So that's where you'd have to go to a toe. So all of those are conditions that we will have applications for. What's the second question? That you had? Motion. Okay, that's oh, yeah, motion. Uh, so we have an automatic locking in system. Obviously, you want to keep the patients still, particularly when the cuff is inflating. That is the critical piece. Because we lock into where the vessel is, we we uh, lock our system in place. So it has a double stick band-aid. So you put a band-aid down and you put our, our ultrasound array, and then you take a wrap and you wrap it around the top. So it gives it slight compression that holds it. We have seen that it holds it in place while the patient, while the cuff is coming up. If there is one step in the whole instruction process, it's trying to explain to the patient that the cuff is gonna be uncomfortable in the calf and not to move. Uh, yes, if they move a lot and it moves the probe, they will have to retest again. That happens today. That's a lot of the reason why the hand movement loses it. We will lose it far less often uh, with our multi-element array. You bet. Yeah. So I worked in the vascular space for two years in uh, LA, and they saw over 20, 30 arterial patients a day. And uh, my question is, would this be focused for the APIs? Like uh, that's exactly what it's doing. Okay. That's and exactly then, uh, what it's doing. I'm just asking because I assume there was the initial doctor when the patient comes in, gets scanned, and but I'm, that I'm glad you asked. The, I, I didn't use the medical terms of ankle brachial index. Uh -huh. That's actually the medical term of what this test is. It's an ankle brachial index. Blood pressure in the arm, blood pressure in two vessels on your feet, and you compare them. You want your arm blood pressure. Usually, you don't have blockages in your arm. You want your arm pressure to be the same as the blood pressure in your leg. If it's 50% in your leg of your arm, that's an indication of a problem. So it is, it's an ankle brachial index. If you allow me to make a comment, yeah. I just want to say that we had two surgeons, uh, or two doctors, and they would always argue whether the ABI report was correct or inaccurate because of a technician error. So I think that bypasses that whole thing. Also, uh, the time spent to do an ABI was also pretty expensive. So I think we'll continue. Why didn't you pay have you in the room? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, also, uh, if you go into a whole other field, which is ontology and, and therapeutic interventions for ontology, if you find the, the, the therapy in line with the chronobiology or the circadian rhythm of the individual, you have a difference in effect of as much as 40% and a significant effect on uh, side effects. So basically the point being that sleep is a driver of outcomes, it's a driver of therapeutic benefits, but it's been hidden underneath the surface. So what we do at Sleep Score Labs is we supercharge health and wellness outcomes by bringing sleep into the picture, leveraging the data and the insights necessary to help make a difference. Um, now, we are a B2B to B2C to company. Uh, we do have a whole variety of technologies and assets which collect data, but we're a B2B to B2C to company. And uh, at the heart of that company, we're connecting the sleep ecosystem. It's a more than $500 billion global market. And what we are doing is we're providing services to a growing number of companies using our data and AI. There are kinds of partners we have include um, obvious partners you might imagine, like Mattress Firm, but we also have partners like L'Oreal, International Privates and Fragrances, uh, partners in the, in the gym and fitness space. And we spun this company out of ResMed, very ResMed, of course, as you may know, is a global leader in sleep medical devices. Why do those companies come to us? They come to us because we have the data, the science, and the technology that they need to deliver new interventions and to improve sleep. And um, without the expertise, they can't achieve that goal. And, and at the heart of this, we have a broader $1.6 trillion consumer health and wellness market, which despite all of their current economic uncertainty continues to grow at a canker in excess of 6%. We, all of us, are beginning to spend more and more of our own money on ensuring that we live longer, happier, healthier lives. And sleep is a driver of those kinds of outcomes, so much so that in this year's McKinsey report, they said that sleep is now the number one concern for consumers. So because of all of that, those companies come to us and we generate, uh, as of 2023, $4.4 million in revenues, mostly recurring from these partnerships. How do we solve this issue? What services do we bring? At heart, it's sleep.ai, it's sleep AI. Now, I just wanted to say something briefly. We have been in sleep AI for more than six years before it became fashionable, right? And uh, in fact, we owned the website property, sleep.ai, for more than six years for that reason. Uh, but uh, as everybody knows, at the center of successful outcomes driven by AI, you gotta start with the data. Because if you don't have the data, you can't build and train the models. We have collected and aggregated more than 500, as of today, 512 plus million hours of sleep data. And we have also used that platform to run a very significant number of intervention studies, more than 235 separate studies on specific sleep interventions, so that we can collect more data, not only about how people sleep, but also about what um, products, services, environmental changes, behavior change, coaching, and so forth has a positive effect on it. And uh, that enables us to deliver outcomes. Those outcomes, uh, which we then basically end to end our platform measured in the form of a significant randomized control trial. And that enabled us to become the first and the only company in the world today, which is fully reimbursed in any country by for providing sleep improving approval services based on data and AI. Uh, a few quick notes about how we managed to achieve this. First things first, uh, everybody sleeps, of course, and uh, as many as 280 million Americans have measured their sleep in one way or another over the last number of years. Apple Watch, Aura Ring, uh, Fitbit, Garmin, and hundreds and hundreds of other devices. Uh, however, the problem with the data from all of those devices is that the data is often very different from each other. It's apples and oranges, and there are quality and accuracy issues, etc. Uh, because we came from ResMed, we have an underlying um, uh, uh, ground truth in our data set, 120 million hours of, of closest to medical grade data that's available, which enabled us to become a bedrock for comparison between all of the systems. And our AI engines, uh, therefore, are enabled to normalize, structure, synchronize the data from wherever it comes. Why does that matter? It matters because the companies that want to deliver sleep services to their consumers, their consumers already have one device or another. The companies don't know how to use the data from those devices to drive back. That's the problem we've solved for them. The second thing is you have to have a lot of deep 
and specialist domain knowledge when it comes to sleep because it is complex, right? And uh, from this, uh, uh, we drive particularly important personalized insights because sleep differs person by person and the challenges or causes are also different person by person. So you've got to start with a really clear understanding of all of that. So this is just a small illustration taking uh, three different um, uh, systems, a uh, system driven by us versus a system driven by Aura versus a system driven by Sleepwatch, which is a very popular app on the uh, on the Apple Watch platform. And uh, this just shows you the level or the depth to which we build um, on our engines, the interventions and, and coaching, which is available from the insights that we, we do, just to show you. So this is the same user using the three different devices on the same night as a small illustration. Because we have built all of this from the data and the ground up, from the ground up, uh, we have also put behind that a significant randomized control trial, and that's what's now achieved full reimbursement uh, this time in the Federal Republic of Germany. So as of today, 74 million people are entitled to use a uh, service using Sleep.ai, and they, uh, their insurance company must pay for it by law without the need for a doctor's prescription. So um, Sleep.ai, now I just ask you to imagine all of the potential applications or use cases for Sleep.ai in terms of data. Well, there's a very obvious ones you can imagine, but well, clearly there's a big opportunity to screen people for disorders. Uh, for example, 90% of people who have sleep apnea globally have yet to be diagnosed. 70% uh, of chronic insomnia also have yet to be diagnosed. And there are many other sleep disorders. Uh, however, sleep disorders is not the only area where data can be used for advantage. As I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, sleep is critical for health outcomes. So if you have a, a business which helps people with mental health challenges, if you don't include sleep, you cannot give the best outcomes. If, if you think about fitness, if you think about performance, if you think about uh, blood sugar measurement, if you think about cardiovascular disease management, in all of these cases and more, by ignoring sleep, you are ignoring the opportunity to deliver the better outcomes. Uh, our platform uh, also has other use cases, and I'll uh, give you some examples of that in terms of how we drive uh, revenues in a few moments. But think about travel and hospitality. People choose a hotel based on where they think they're going to get the best sleep. And why do they pay money for light flat seats on transatlantic airlines? Because they need to get sleep. So. <laughs> A driver, well, some, some, some want to throw the champagne. But, um, <laughs> yeah, 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 sleep is, is really key. Well, the challenge in all of this is where the data to enable all of these businesses to be driven, and that's what sleep.ai on our platform does. So, you can't boil the ocean. We decided to focus on three core business or use cases of our uh, platform. Uh, the first one is health and wellness apps. What we do is we've taken the sleep.ai, turned it into SDK and APIs, and that's now being built into more and more health and wellness apps so that they can uh, basically understand the sleep issues within their populations and how that drives their business, but also build services. That's a very simple software as a service model. And we typically charge or earn between 75 and up to $400,000 per year, depending on the scale of our partner. And that part of our business is growing. We launched uh, some new services earlier this year. Reimbursed programs, I mentioned, clearly inside Germany alone, there are 74 million people and we earn a fee per member per year. And the place where we started to monetize initially with the data platform was driving R&D for a, a growing array of companies. There's a very strong competitive moat. We can discuss that in a little bit more detail later, but it starts with the data, like everything. And uh, in terms of the business that we've been building, our margins exceed 80% gross. And uh, we are uh, on track to be EBITDA positive before the end of 2024. So we're already almost there. And uh, what we are doing uh, with this amazing team, my own background, Westmed, and uh, uh, clinical or the, the global leader in sleep medical devices, my, my uh, COO has four years' experience in, in Philips, and we've surrounded ourselves with an amazing group of people, uh, sleep research scientists, uh, data scientists, and so forth, to deliver this service. Uh, we're raising a $3 million note. We've already closed the first $600,000. We have 1.4 million circles, so essentially it looks like there's about $1 million left in the round. 
And our focus is to use that to drive sales and marketing so that we can further expand the revenue line. The multiples in this space are very strong. We have two existing investors at the table who are potential acquirers, both Restman, which owns a share of the company, and also um, Mattress Firm, which also has investors in the company. But there are others. Um, and uh, we'd ask you to come along and join us, uh, help the world to sleep better, but doing so not with the hot air, but rather with data and science to transform the air Thank you. What's the term to be right? So it's a 25% uh, uh, discount and a 10% interest. Uh, the cap is at 26 million. Um, and we also have an additional uh, value, which is 50% more in And your exit is what? The exit? Uh, we, we think the exit is going to be within about two years. So the people at the table at the moment, if we take Redmond as a great example, it's a tremendous track record um, uh, of making significant uh, acquisitions in the space. They want the company to be even that positive. And they have paid between uh, 10 and 30 times revenues for companies which are strategically relevant. And then the piece, is it a product or is it data? It's, it's, a, it's a data, AI, predictive and analytics platform. Okay. Um, how did you aggregate all of the data from what your sources? That's great. Because yeah, I have a similar, and I'd like to talk to you if you want to say about something that you can cover, that we're aggregating data. It's a deep SaaS data AI platform. Right. So, where'd you get all your data? We started by building a direct to consumer application yeah, of our own, um, and that cost time and money. Um, but we collected a large amount of data. But because we use a resume technology, the data is of a far higher acuity and trustworthy nature than, than most. Now, once we have a scale of more than 100 million hours of that data, then we open up our platform to collect data from all other sources. So today we now collect data from more than 500 separate different devices. Um, but we're able to overlap that data, which enables us to build the models. But we have to start by going direct to consumer to build the first piece of the data set. Companies I thought I would have heard there about are they coming to you to service their employees or giving products that they're working with? Oh no, they're 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 coming to us to to drive their R&D platforms. And uh, so, for example, international flavors and fragrances, we've helped them to develop nine separate sleep improving uh, fragrance combinations. Um, and we have collected millions and millions of hours of data to support that R&D process. It's very efficient, very fast, and it gets real products to the market around which they can make strong claims. And those products are then the process of going into multiple CPG um, areas, as you can imagine. Their body is very similar. Um, we have them to drive a whole new series of products in the sleep space. The first of them that was launched last year, the massage, massage the device to wear around your face. Very, not, not during sleep, before going to sleep, very effective. And uh, in all cases, we're looking for not just did people like them and what kind of soft and woolly statements we can make about them, but let's see the hard data. Let's see what effect any intervention has on sleep. That's that's our model. And you can imagine the, the possibilities in our models, which is one of the reasons why so many companies are partnering with us. We now have uh, AI models that combine an understanding of how any given person sleeps, but also what intervention out of the hundreds of interventions that you've studied actually works best for them. And that's the that's the goal. Connecting the data to the right solution. I'm downloading your app right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and just, just remember, we do we do have a consumer app, it's called the Deep Store app. It's a premium model, it's free to use, but we are not an app company. We do that as a test and learn environment. We don't even try to promote it. Um, because uh, essentially what we are doing is we're putting this entire technology platform into lots of other people's businesses. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. I think you've got it upside down. Hi, everyone. My name is Tina John. I am a biomedical engineer, mother of two girls, and founder and CEO of Vera. 
Today, I want to introduce to you a groundbreaking technology in the space of breastfeeding that will change the platform of breastfeeding going forward. But first, let me introduce you to baby Vera. So baby Vera is nursing at my breast and she's having difficulty latching. Because she's having difficulty latching, every time she comes back to the breast, I'm experiencing pain. And also, she's signaling to my breast to create less and less milk each day because she's not uh, drawing enough milk from the breast. 1.2 million mothers each year go through issues, these issues, and or turn to exclusive breast pumping, the top left image. This is where they pump and express milk eight to 12 times from the breast in a day, and then feed the infant a separate eight to 12 times a day. This adds about four to six hours of activity in a newborn parent's life after all of the sleep that they're losing already. After talking to over 150 mothers around the country about uh, breast pumping and their experiences with breastfeeding, we've learned that breast pumping technology is, was never meant to feed the child that's right now. This is why we have been quietly building the Vera Smart Feeding Pump. This is the first device in the world that will allow you to express milk into the canister in the back, like, an, uh, like a wearable pump, but also will allow you to feed the infant at the same time. And while the infant is being fed, you'll be able to track how much the baby is drinking live by the 0.1 ounce accuracy and see that on your on the mother's mobile phone. This will allow confidence about how much the baby is drinking, how much you're producing and storing, and it will save about four hours of time to exclusive pumping mothers who are relying on pumping technology to feed their infants. Now the device works by storing milk in the back canister, which can be removed and poured off if needed. But as the baby is drinking, the device is sensing that the baby is suckling and re-pushing milk into the canister, into the front nipple, as the baby is demanding it. We're then tracking the amount that's going from the mother to the infant and reporting that with data and analytics for the mother to have, be able to share with their clinician as well. The device is also able to uh, record and watch the opacity of the milk that's traveling from the mother to the infant. This correlates with the fattiness of milk which tells the mother at what times of day or what times of their, of their gestation with their baby, they're having what type of fattiness. We can also see how quickly the baby is drinking and uh, suckling and how deeply the baby is suckling. The breast pump market is a $2.5 billion market right now. I say that because we will open up a new category in breast pumps called feeding pumps. We plan to encompass 5% of that market within the next five years. Now we'll get out into the market in three uh, different ways. First, direct to consumer via our own website and then websites like Amazon. Second, by insurance. Insurance models will reimburse 100 to $250 per mother per uh, pregnancy for every double breast breast pump. And lastly, as we gain traction, we'll go out to retail markets um, where we will uh, go uh, focus on Target and Walmart where you see uh, wearable pumps on the shelves right now. Now our key uh, competitors are branded wearables such as LV and Willow. These devices are pumps and wearable pumps. Now, unlike any of these devices, none of them are able none of them are able to feed the infant as well uh, at the same time. However, our device can be used to only pump and therefore intercede these markets. These uh, companies have raised about 160 million dollars through Series C, and LV reported. Um, uh, revenue of 200 million three years after they launched their wearable. We will market our device at $550 for two units, which is comparable to those devices that don't have the feeding capability um, with our wearable pumps. And in two years, we'll come out with our next uh, technology, which is a low cost feeder, one set of electronics on the hip, feeding capability up at the breast. And that will lower our cost to $250, which will be largely covered by insurance. 90% of the revenue that you see on the screen here is covered by these two devices, our flagship device and our second medical device that will come out two years later. The team behind all this magic is an amazing group of individuals who are, as we speak, working on converting our uh, device to manufacturing and production units. Between us, we have over 50 patents, over 20 F FDA 510K clearances, and dozens of consumer and medical devices in our portfolio. 
One, uh, three years ago, we raised a $1 million uh, pre-seed round. We're currently in a $3.5 mil $3 million seed round, of which we have raised $2.1 million on a safe but $20 million free money valuation. As we, uh, this $3.5 million round will get us through FDA clearance and out to 500 mothers on the market. We'll focus on bloggers, listicles, writers, people who will get this uh, consumer market and it's going to be out to other mothers. So I encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions and of course, uh, be involved in our journey. Our angel investors this round have been doing 25,000 to $250,000 investments each. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. First question. Yeah. Did you say you, there's a function between a direct feed and you can change it to function as like just pumping? Yeah. So you can so pump and feed at the same time. You can just feed if you'd like, or you could just pump. Okay. And so it'll detect automatically when the baby is feeding if you use that function. But that being able to pump and feed at the same time is something you cannot do currently. Yeah. Safe space. I have a lot of new mother friends. Yes. This is exactly what they need. Yes. <laughs> this is why we made it. Just so many women have reached out about they're having so much difficulty with feeding. They're embarrassed by it and they feel like there's no other option for them. They feel guilty. No. No. Like, oh, it's not. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yes, it's installed. It'll go to the FDA within about three or four months. We're getting our production units and we're working on them with our manufacturers abroad. And then after testing, it'll go to the FDA and by mid-year next year, we'll have our clearance. Where, where are you planning to do your production? So we have, uh, we've been sourcing uh, manufacturers for about six to eight months. All of the manufacturers which you've identified are near the Shenzhen region in China. So we're talking about PCBs, um, injection molded, uh, silicone injection molded plastics. We've seen our competitors at these places. We've seen Yeti and um, uh, large companies that are manufacturing, but essentially all of our manufacturers. So we are, um, for two units, we're $185, so 65% margins. And that's including packaging all of the different components on products. And the connecting the two types of phones? Yes, it is. Low edge here. Um, I'm not sure, but BLE is we have essentially Bluetooth connection to our app and that's delivering. But we have some onboard storage and then it pushes it. Oh, yes, we so we have our first granted patent was in November 2022, and that is for the counting and feeding mechanism, which is broad, past breast pumps can be on bottles, can be on anything else. We have uh, open patents in the US and uh, eight different locations around the world. Europe, Brazil, uh, China, Singapore, et cetera. And that is for more broad patents that are on uh, um, big and big. Is it a battery or is it a plug charge? It's a, uh, it's battery, absolutely. It's USB-C, but we also have a separately sold dock charger that yeah. you can use and then it just set it down and dash a charger. Cause I can yeah. see some mothers, like they forget to charge it. Yes. And then they can do a portable while they're pumping to get a number. Yes, yes. So actually we have a dock charger that you can just set it down on because some people forget to actually plug it and set it down with it. Now, because of safety, you can't plug while you're using. Mm -hmm. So uh, generally you don't allow that electric current to work. So it has to be just while you're not. Yeah. In terms of the app, is there anything incorporating AI? Um, so it can and likely will in the future. So an interesting aspect of our device is that um, we have the baby suckling from the device at a certain speed. We have the mother pumping from a separate device. Um, we can start to bind both of those. So we're learning from the baby suckle and actually letting the mother experience that same thing. Um, and not to mention optimizing the, the amount of milk that's produced because of the way that you're pumping. Yeah, because it affects the... It affects that. And the thing is, when you have a small infant, almost all of them have difficulty feeding at first. Mm -hmm. And so we can really learn from the patterns. And for instance, we can slow the milk progression down to the nipple. Mm -hmm. um, if, for instance, the baby is not suckling hard enough, we can start to maybe make it a little bit harder so that they can suck a little bit harder and harder and learn that if they suck a little bit harder, they'll be able to get more milk. But that's really once the baby is comfortable. A lot of our infants have latch issues at first, and they need to get a month in. And then in the meantime, you have the moms on that first feeding train. Okay, thank you.
Joy. I think our first round of presenters, and at this point comes the most important part of the day. No, not the food. It's the using the QR codes to capture information and give us feedback, give these start feedback in, in, in if you have it, following up with them, provide more information, make introductions, what have you. We will then take about a 20 minute break, have some drinks, have some we'll go with some tea. We have some food left in there as well. And we'll come back for the second half of the presentation. So let's stop for a few seconds and everybody get the QR code out. Take this as it show up on your uh, screen. You can either grab this card that's on the chair and get that covered, or if you really just want to just write it out on a piece of paper, maybe these uh, chair pen paper on it, or just write it out. <laughs> Some people
And we look at the rest of our day here. We just finished our break. We're going to have four more pitches this afternoon. Park said there's five, but workflow could not make it. So there's just four. And after those four, we're going to have closing remarks and then walk over to the happy hour place. So we should be finishing up around four o'clock today. And hope to have that time for more networking if we can. It'd be great. So next up for our next round is going to be Lex. So with that, we'll pass it over to Dylan. And he'll kick it off and take us forward to the next round. There we go. Next. How do y'all? My name is Dylan. Uh, friends call me Dogwater Dylan, aka DWD. I'm an Air Force veteran, uh, and I started this company when I was working with military dogs, and I learned how they were staying hydrated, and that it was really cool. And those dogs are super important. Uh, on average, one of those dogs saves uh, 400 lives, so they're kind of like the unsung heroes. Uh, of our, our forces. But yeah, this is uh, Lix, like Gatorade for dogs. <laughs> so hydration is super important for dogs, right? But it's not always easy to keep our dogs hydrated. So uh, this can look like for some folks, uh, a five, six, $700 vet bill uh, to bring them in and get them rehydrated. Um, if your dog is like mine, super active, loves to go for walks and run around and play with the kids and things like that, they come inside and he just passes out on the cold tile. And I'm like, no, please go to your food and water bowl. Like you need to like <laughs> go and get rehydrated. Or maybe you have a dog that's sick and not feeling well or suffers from separation anxiety. Like you go to work and you come home and you've noticed they haven't touched their water or maybe they're getting older. Um, or they're traveling and being kennel. There's a whole variety of reasons why dogs don't drink water and, and it's hard for them uh, to. And there's a big problem in a big market. So 70% of Americans uh, have a pet at home. It's about 225 million people. And we like to say good dogs deserve great water. So um, our uh, market spans um, across generations uh, from uh, millennials to Gen Zs. Who are actually adopting dogs at a faster rate than they're having kids, um, all the way uh, to you know even the baby boomer generation. Doesn't matter where you fall on that generational spectrum. Uh, the point is that uh, pet parents love their pets, and eight out of ten of them agree that they'll stop spending in other places of their budget for the health and wellness of their pet. And so you might go to the um, pet store and you're going to find a ton of innovation and in, uh, the pet food aisle. You're going to see all the different flavors and packagings and treats. Um, but other than just water, there's this huge white space that's being created uh, in the market. Um, and now there is competition, but a lot of it is more about like functional benefits uh, rather than pure hydration. And this problem is so significant that even the US military has been uh, looking for uh, solutions and doing research uh, on dog hydration. And these are the best, most well-trained active dogs in our country. And they even have uh, trouble, trouble getting them to their water bowl. So I found this research um, and I created my own version. It's uh, a powdered pack. So you get 28 hydration sticks in every pack. So think about like a crystal light stick or a liquid IV stick or any of those electrolyte mixes you see on the market. Um, it's all natural. It's a blend of coconut water and chicken broth. You can mix it into water, add it on top of their food as a hydrating food topper. You can also freeze it into uh, uh, ice cubes. So, uh, you know, it's electrolyte that tastes like chicken. It feels just really good. So why choose us? Well, we have proven um, market traction. So we've uh, had about $25,000 in beta sales over the last year. Uh, I was selling a liquid uh, product in a 12 ounce can before I pivoted to uh, the powder for higher margins. Um, and really what I was doing over that year was just pitching to customers one-on-one, -on -one, really understanding who they are, their pain points, the value propositions that they're interested in, you know, like what, what's going on with their dogs. Uh, we grew our Instagram following to 13,000. Um, I launched an online e-commerce website to see what shipping and fulfillment would be like and a subscription model. I've seen about $250 average lifetime value of a customer. And some of our customers went over $425 uh, so in less, less than a year. So we have a subscription model available. Uh, we sell through digital channels. 
uh, Amazon online, Walmart online. This needs to be updated for uh, Academy Sports and Outdoors. Um, we have a Shopify store. Uh, you know, we use uh, TikTok and Instagram influencers to promote our product. We have uh, email campaigns that follow up uh, Google ads for SEO optimization. We sell through physical channels like the American Kennel Club uh, and the North America Diving Dogs. These are some of the largest uh, dog competitions, uh, competitive events in the nation. They have a huge following and it's growing super fast. Uh, we're planting our flag as the first hydration product in that market. Uh, and then I was uh, selected as uh, one of the top 60 companies in DFW to showcase the product at a brand showcase where we got interest from Central Market and some of the clubs uh, for retail opportunities. Mm -hmm. So the e-commerce strategy, uh, use uh, pet influencers to drive our demand. So we have a network of 20,000 pet influencers that we send our product to. All of our uh, um, product is managed by uh, DFW CPG, so they, um, they're individuals in the CPG category that uh, basically manage uh, the materials, the, the packaging, the raw uh, inventory. And then once that raw inventory is produced in Dallas, it's sent across the street to our fulfillment center, uh, where then it's sent out um, to, our, uh, to our customers through what channel they purchase it. Uh, Jumpstart CPG does our Amazon and Walmart. Um, they're an amazing uh, growth firm on, on these platforms uh, ran by ex-Amazon employees. And then uh, 6 Plus 1 and Dog Connectors are, are uh, Shopify and Instagram um, and branding uh, partners. And so we sell that 28 pack. So there's 28 individual uh, spits and one pack for $55. We have an 87% gross margin. Um, what this looks like over five years is surpassing 72 million in revenue, um, and we're looking to exit at a five to ten uh, multiple off the top line. Uh, we'll be pushing 90% uh, gross uh, profits once we get to uh, economies of scale. We can uh, reduce the supplier costs a bit, um, focus on our fulfillment pricing, and then uh, continue to maintain a lean payroll. So our team, me, uh, I got. Few years in the pet industry, uh, I had a, a software business working with military dogs before this. That's how I learned about this research. Um, Eric is an amazing creative director. He's the founder of Six Plus One. They're leading our entire brand strategy right now. Uh, he's responsible for launching iconic brands like Vitamin Water, Pirates Booty, Core Hydration, uh, um, a lot of really great body armor. Um, Roger Seeley is an investor. He, you might see him on the TV show Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch. Uh, David Deering, he's co-founded a business with uh, Bryson DeChambeau, the professional golfer. And John Paglia, he's a prof professor of finance at Pepperdine University. Uh, he's a board member on a beverage uh, holding company. Um, really strong team uh, that we've built to take this uh, to market to be very successful. So we're raising $250,000 for 15% equity. It's the only raise that we'll ever need. We have capital committed. Um, the first 25,000 committed in the last two weeks of pitching, I guess, I've been doing this. Um, we'll be spending on digital marketing, uh, event marketing to go out to those events that I was mentioning, like KC, other places like that, uh, where we find our early adopters. And then 50,000 in payroll for the starving entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> And that's it. So thank you guys so much for listening and I'll turn it back to y'all for questions. Yeah, I have several questions and comments. Uh, number one, what's in the hydration bag? It's a blend of uh, <laughs> coconut water and chicken broth, but in the powder format. It's interesting combination, um, especially coconut water and chicken broth. But okay. Um, and is there anything that uh, I would assume the blend is a trade secret? Yeah, You're not patenting it, right? Not patenting it, it's a trade secret. Right. Question uh, when I look at the growth um, charts, uh, that is a hockey stick that I very rarely see. So, what really transpired between years three and four and four and five to precipitate that type of super growth? What are you doing organizationally or through your partnerships to get that kind of growth? Yeah, so. That's a great question. Um, I model based off of the last year of what I've done um, and the significance I've seen in the market. 
This market is huge. hundred million dogs in the U.S. alone, two and a half to three million are in our early adopter category of this business. That's where we're going to be focusing uh, the majority of our, our efforts uh, to get started. Um, we'll be launching on Amazon online. It's the largest retailer. We're going to be putting a lot of focus into that. Yeah, but tell me what you're doing specifically between years three and four mm -hmm. that you weren't doing before mm -hmm. and four and five. Because that's the start of your inception. Yeah. Uh, well, as you scale, you get more customers and then we're reinvesting that profit back into the business. Continue the ad spend uh, and then just continue the growth. Yeah, final, just a comment. <clears throat> One of my clients is called Well Doing Pets, the guy who is called my show. I'm more than happy to do an introduction. He's a franchise across the United States. I appreciate that. Thank you. Can you do this for, for guys? I mean, like, we wanted to be hydrated. Is it happening? What's my, my colleague here is facing the person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Totally human safe. It's my second favorite drink. <laughs> the recurring revenue nature of the deal. Oh, yeah. So, the recurring revenue uh, of the business uh, through our subscriber growth. So, um, we're estimating customer acquisition costs uh, between $18 to $38, um, 100,000 subscribers in this market grows us to $60 million in annual recurring revenue. Um, and everything I've done, I've modeled very conservative, like a retention rate of 25%, um, and, you know, a strategy to just keep reinvesting those gross margins to the growth of the business, um, eyeballing um, the next exit. Have you thought about going on Shark Tank? This is the kind of thing that Shark Tank would do really well. I actually had Shark Tank call me, uh, and they uh, asked for a, uh, a video submission. Uh, for the product, I'll uh, might also be going on Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch, which is on uh, cable TV. Uh, pitch there as well. I think that would also help with that hockey stick to get that nav <laughs> market. Well, yeah, yeah you, you know, the key on this one is actually I like what you're doing with the influencer market. I think that makes sense. If you can get into the military, that would be great. Uh, one of the things you could do is go on the uh, uh, Defense Department supply contracts, as well as the uh, General Services Administration contracts. Now, if you had a minority owner, a female owner, a veteran, yeah. part, you can get special set-asides for the pets, and therefore it becomes an easier thing. It may be another route. I wouldn't detract from what you're doing. Sure. But that's a really good route, especially if you're doing it for the military. I appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, that's my background. I was a defense contractor after I got out of the military. And I ran contracting for the feds. Oh, nice. So I did SBIR um, grants um, and funding and built some software for those dogs and their units. And I still have the contacts with all the purchasers. And, <laughs> and show how Jim Allen was next time. Not here. Yeah, yeah. Just a thought. Yeah. Appreciate it. What did you raise after this? After the 250? Yeah. Uh, zero. So this is uh, the one and only round. I think you need more money up front than 250. If it were up to me, given what I see in the markets today, I would at least go for 500, mm -hmm. you know, and I would keep that at 15 for, I, I'd probably maybe take it down a little I mean your valuation three million bucks basically mm -hmm. is not a bad valuation mm -hmm. for a same group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have capacity to take on five hundred, uh depending on the right strategic investors that come along. Uh two fifty will definitely give us eighteen months of runway to get started. Or do it this way, do a certain round and then do warrants for the remaining part. But I think you're going to be short on money. Sure. Because part of it's going to be competing against others if you don't have any protection. Yeah. And if you're a trade secret, if it starts taking off, then uh, people are going to be uh, coming up with something similar. Sure. I mean, we can take a couple of our failed companies, the mm -hmm. coconut water and chicken broth, and put them together right. and be a competitor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm being somewhat yeah. funny, but yeah. I'm unfortunately serious. Yeah. No, and I'm, I would love to have that conversation, follow up with you about that and kind of the strategy you see. Um, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a category we're creating. So, 
uh, for competitors to come in would be kind of a badge of honor and expand our market. Uh, and that would be yeah, a as to you look at Mars as being potential for a bio. Yeah, Mars would be a good one. Uh, like Netflix Arena. Or I'm also looking at like beverage companies that might want access into the pet industry since it's such a growing industry. Yeah. I would probably go with a pet company that wants uh, an adjacency into another category. Is this liquid IV for dogs, basically? Yeah. I'm looking at Instagram. Yeah, it's liquid IV for dogs. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're like. Click around this. Right over here. Oh, that's your thing. It's like a quick forward to the same class. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me to Southern California. Enjoying uh, being here and with presenting to 10 Capital. Uh, here today to tell you about pain pause. And as an aside, I really wanted to name it Pain Pause P A W S. <laughs> you know, uh, referring to the previous one, but my wife had named it, said, no, we can't do that. So, anyway, um, I, uh, my company, Kyta Tech, has developed a, a technology, and we used it initially, it's a platform patent technology, to develop one product. And then we found it could be used for something else, pain. And pain, chronic pain, which is what we're focusing on is the most common medical condition. It's huge and I've had it my whole life, so I have some passion around it. So what is the micropoint technology? Micropoints are tiny, almost hair-like points that are incorporated into an array, they're metal, and they have adhesive backing. And that means they can be applied just like a Band-Aid or a skin patch. And that makes them ideal as a consumer product. This technology was developed over several years and we have a number of issued patents and many more pending and we have patents overseas as well. So we took this technology and we used it to create our MicroMed wound culture product. And the wound closure product we've shown has a strength of closing wounds like stitches, very strong. And we put it on the consumer market so that people can stay at home. It was during COVID we put this on and not have to go to the ER. And we've done really well with it. We've sold over $5 million worth of product. Walgreens, we've done well. They've doubled, well, increased the price from $19 to $30 in the last year. The CVS has exploded. Walgreens is too. We just got twenty thousand dollars in orders today. CVS has really exploded. They're up one hundred percent, one hundred ten percent this year, seventy percent year over year. And we have different packaging depending on who's selling it. Putting themselves on top, which is our Amazon <laughs> brands. So what happened is we shifted our focus. It's a great story to pain. And pain, chronic pain, is the most common medical disorder. We heard about some of them today earlier about heart disease, cancer, diabetes. This is more common than that. It's 50 million Americans, 26 million have diabetes, for example. It's very common. So how do we make this great discovery? I wish I could say I made it, but I did not. Um, one of our investors is an orthopedic surgeon who had to quit, quit practicing because of back pain. <laughs> I gave him one. And he put it on his back because he had chronic pain, he had to quit practicing it, and his back came out. And I said, that's impossible. These little tiny points can do that. And then I put it on mine, I have had sciatic system, not a control in a way. Then the funny moment for me, I put it on one of our board members, who's an esteemed physician, former president of American Society of Plastic Surgeons, big honcho uh, at J&J. At, at, uh, &J. And he called me the next day after he put it on. He said, this works so we all know this completely. 
So then over the next few years, we started putting it on friends, family, investors in a wide variety and increasing number of conditions. You can see just a partial list. You've probably been about 15 conditions now. We have we have experience, and then I'll show you clinical data as well in these different conditions. The advantage of the product, as I said, it's as easy to put on here as a patch, and it's drug free, and that makes it almost unique about among all the consumer products out there because they all have like medicated patches. You've got your leave. You've got your Volterra, which has medication in it. And it also is rapid acting and it treats severe pain, which is a big advantage over other products that are used to treat pain today by consumers. And lastly, so we did a clinical study. I, I'm an oncologist and I live and die by clinical studies. That's what we grow up. I've written, designed, <laughs> and executed every clinical study in every company. And I don't want to put something in the market unless I can show it works. And it's rare among consumer pain relief products to actually be tested. But we did this. 23 elderly patients, severe chronic pain, 18 got pain and pause, five got placebo. It's the same device, same patch, but just tinier points that don't really point pain. We used a FDA sanctioned endpoint, more than a 30% decrease in the pain level. That was our endpoint. We don't need FDA approval, but I've used that endpoint before. For pain studies, it's pretty standard. We met that primary endpoint in 17 out of the 18 pain pause treated patients. Only one of the five placebo, and that one was only 31% if I had to count it. A average 60% decrease in pain, and it lasted for a week in most of them. So, how does this work? Well, the two key elements are not only the micro points, but these springs we developed in this patent. And when you apply these on the skin, the springs force these little micro points just under the surface. And right there, as we learned in medical school, are nerve endings called the Sinian corpuscles that are receptors activated under pressure. And when they're activated, they stimulate nerves that actually block pain and spinal cord. This is protected by an issued US patent today. We have several more patents pending. It's made by one of the outstanding manufacturers of tapes and bandages in the world. They make the products for 3M. And for me, importantly, having done many FDA uh, approval products, this does not require FDA approval. It's called a exempt device, minimal risk. All you do is register. You can literally sell it the next day. <laughs> Yeah, I spent my life dealing with this. So 40 million Americans have chronic musculoskeletal disorders. I'm sure you're familiar with the ones. Most of us have had five, an average of five different treatments. Many of us like me have had steroid injections, surgeries, and we end up with severe pain, average person for 11 years, and many patients for their whole lifetime. So what are we looking for? We want a convenient way to treat our pain at home. And what happens is there is a one. So literally 10 million people a year end up getting prescribed narcotics for their chronic pain. It's a big problem, as you know. So what about consumer products? Well, the problem is they only provide temporary relief measured in just a few hours, not in days. And they only provide pain relief for mild conditions. Another important point is there are safety issues with these products. Not only with the lead and Advil, but these other products have medications, usually an anesthetic in them. And the FDA recently has put warnings out about these products. So our product addresses the issues. A natural way to treat your pain without drugs, long lasting relief, and treat the severe pain of the chronic pain patient. Easy as this to apply as a bandage or a patch. Importantly, and really important, is it's drug free. <laughs> and finally, clinically validated. And we have three additional studies ongoing, including one on starting up in LA next week in plantar fasciitis. So we'll continue to do that. Another differentiator is we only have one product, just one, treat all of these conditions. 
And it's the same as the loop culture product. So we basically have one product. I'm not going to say we're going to continue with one product as we move forward. <laughs> but for the pain and for the loop culture, that's what we're going to do. We have others for the future that I'm not going to talk about because there's other applications of the technology. So two patches are going to cost $26. That'll give you two weeks of pain relief. Four patches will give you a month of relief. Most people are going to be repeat users. And so a subscription model is a nice model for this. Margins are high, and they'll continue to get higher and higher volumes. So we're using a direct-to-consumer approach to sell the product, like most consumer products. We're starting in October. The first step is to optimize messaging and also determine which segments to go after. There's so many different segments, and I'll show you in a minute, they're very large in terms of revenue, and we can't do them all. So we'll select two or three to begin with, and then we'll move to others. We also believe, and we're already doing, is we can sell this obviously to CVS. We're already in discussions with them, and then Walgreens. And then I think that actually chiropractors, 40 million people see them a year. It's an ideal product. 90% of them sell products. So if you do the calculations, a very modest number of using it a year, you come out of the $6 billion market. It's very large. And each of the individual markets, as I said, extremely large, as you can see. And with a 1% penetration, you're looking at $80 million in revenue in four years. So you've got $78 million in revenue in 2028. Net income of $33 million and an EBIT approaching 50%. Acquisition, that's the usual route in which uh, these companies uh, are exited. Nearly every pharmaceutical company and many medical device companies are not only in the pain space, they're in the consumer product space. And they're in the topical products. Uh, examples, Voltaren got bought by one of the major companies. Um, you've got Salon Pass by Hisamuja. Reddit bought another one of the topical products, and they are being bought. Uh, these topical products as well as the pills. If you look at comps, we project a 12x uh, um, ROI and 24x ROI in 2027 and 28. Great team, don't have a lot of time left, but Ed Truitt, our chairman, has done a lot of work selling pretty major companies, consumer products. Paul Liam, 20 years of developing medical devices. Laura Dell, one of the top pain specialists in the country, and she's head of pain medicine. She won't let me say which one, but one of the three top healthcare systems in Los Angeles, Eric, Los Angeles. Her husband is actually the inventor of this. And John Kennedy, I talked about it earlier. So we're initiating a $3 million note at the term shown. It's going to be used to support marketing, marketing, marketing. That's what's important with seeing. Uh, works <laughs> just now. You got to market. That's the key, and you got to differentiate it. And then finally, I'll just say that our technology was based on MicroMed. My micro point technology. We showed it works. It's MicroMed. We're selling it, selling it successfully. Now we're going after a very large market, chronic pain, and we show it works. And it works in many different positions. We have issued patents. We're launching next month, and we're looking for resources, funding, in order to do that launch. So that's our story. Thanks a lot. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, how, so in one patch, uh, how long does it last, and does it survive sweating? Oh, yeah. It lasts a week. You usually leave the patch on yeah. the whole week. Yeah. And for many of us, most of us, have to take it off. The pain will continue to be relieved for three to five days. Amazingly, with repeated use like me, then two weeks, then four weeks, then eight weeks. You get, it tends to extend out. A lot of people find that. And I don't know why. There's a lot of these things we don't understand. But, it, but it's seven, we, we're claiming seven days because that's what we have to put the data on. Because I can see this in the, the athletic space because I did yeah. a workout this morning and I spent some hours using a massage bed on my back. Yeah, well, so, it's used for that. In fact, one of our one of our guys that are sales guys is now a football agent. He uses it for that and he's already, he's just got 12 teams he works with in the teams and we've already got a pro bowler who's using it, and he'll be our first influencer. So, yeah, I agree. 
So I guess you yeah. Yeah, so several questions. Number one, um, how fast does it work? If I put and, and uh, yeah. is it like within an hour, two hours a day, or is it cumulative based upon your body adjusting to? It's like if I have a pain in my neck and I get hit on my arm, I won't worry about the pain in my neck kind of thing. Yeah. It lasts, uh, I mean, just how fast and variable. I put one on the last week on somebody. It, lasted, it was gone in five minutes. Their chairman, 10 minutes for her wife. Her wife. Uh, I would say typically it's about an hour. It doesn't take a day or something. How many, si how many different sizes do you have? As I said, we only need one size for everything. Well, let's say I have a bad back and I have a bad You only need. So I, can, I can use it within a small area and it will. Yes. A little, a bit, a little <laughs> and not be an I being, being, a, being the compulsive doctor I am, I said, oh, we need a big patch. <laughs> big pause. Well, I mean, saying, like, like salon pass, and we put it on and it hurt. So I went back to our little micro mag, and my great inventor of this said, Ron, I only use one or two of these on my back. That's what I'm doing. I got them on right now. Third, third question. If you say it's clinically tested, yeah. what, is the, what is the clinical test to use to, to, to tell me that it's clinically tested? Well, I showed, I showed the study. We did a study. In, the first study is in 18 patients, so it's a small study. We had patients who were placebo who had the same patch, but they had smaller points. And I've done previous studies, but we tested different ones, and it didn't work. So that was placebo, and the other ones got pain pops. They got one patch per week, each of them. So that was the first study. We're now almost done with the second back pain study that's a little larger. And then we're doing a knee pain study now. I started a plantar fasciitis study. We put it actually in the heel there where the nerve is, Tom, to have a little foot. And then what I usually do, because I do foot studies, I, before I spend $100,000, $200,000, I want to show it works. And then we'll do uh, a larger 70. I usually, other pain studies have done about 80 patients. That's enough for any chunk. And those will be the studies that really, that really give us that solid you know, stuff we need to get the plants. Yeah. 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 Right. Like, so it's got a partial replacement. How does it work? It's treating. The I mean, is, is that good for like under like that? Like, yeah, it's treating pain. No, I get that. It's not, and it's what it's actually. It does, because he has a partial replacement. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, because the thing is, I did not sleep, I tell you guys, but it really works on the nerve. For example, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you have hip pain, the guy who's a sales guy, he was putting it here, and that inventor was brilliant, that one kid said, so then put it there, put it here, that's where your nerve is, yeah, it beats yeah. that, and it's on the surface. Yeah. And here he said, don't put it on your heel, which you can't anyway, put it in the what's called the tarsal tunnel, that's where the nerve is, it beats it. So you can put it with the nerve side. You got back pain, you put it right near, and that's what I do for my sciatica. Right near the center of the spine. Yeah. It's, 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 it sounds like it's like acute. Yeah, people say that it's not because uh, it may have some effects. Because, but acupuncture is a needle that's four to eight millimeters long. Yeah, this is one millimeter. Those, those receptors are one millimeter. Close so conceptually, it's impinging upon the nerve or inflaming yes. or bringing something to that nerve. You, you, you know, <laughs> you know what's interesting though. We do this whenever we have pain. What do you do when you have? I like that. What, what do you do when you have pain? What's the first thing you do? I get asked. Me. No, I mean in terms of you put pressure on. Oh yeah. yeah. And pressure is what activates yeah. these receptors. It's fascinating, but this does a much better job. But that's what we do, and that's how these things called the deep of pain going on. Yeah. How much does it cost to make it? Uh, it costs. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I have to have idea, but it's about seven to nine dollars, and they're selling it. For twenty six to thirty six dollars, depending on whether it's uh, no, I'm not attached because you said there was two. There was two in there for twenty six. Yeah, two. But they sell it as a two pack. Yeah, right. Uh, right. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. you're saying seven to nine dollars for two, two? Yeah, two. Oh. Yeah, that's the way. It, it, eventually, it'll be made overseas for four or five dollars. Right. But we right now being the USA, yeah, it's a great <laughs> manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. 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 And we don't want to take it. Yeah. In early October, but very soon. Yeah.
Great. Yeah. And then report to me. I'll be my part. Yeah. I'm always trying to get testimonials. Because I know somebody. Yeah. 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 And I do. I do want to say, if it works on everybody, whatever it is, I don't believe it. So I call it just finally. I guess the confidence we have to see effectiveness. Advocacy is how well it works in the clinical setting. Advocacy is how it works in the real world. Right. So if it works in 90% of the patients, the real one will probably going to work in 70%. So it's still going to work probably. Okay. Question. Yeah. So how did you come up with the poison control? Uh, we did a lot of testing, and we actually failed the first time. We had it out for a beta test of 50, and everybody said that's ridiculous. And then what I did is I actually looked at how much it cost if you were going to use not the UA salon pass to put it on every eight hours for 10 days, or how long uh, a tube, a large tube of Volterra costs. And it's the same exactly how exactly comfortable it comfortable costs. So that, that, that's a lot of things. Yeah. 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 Exactly, the risk makers over there. Yeah, hi. Uh, wow, what a group of people. Uh, we sleep better, like they better, can hydrate. What's next? Well, we're going to see the whole all of our problems now. We have to Yeah, I'm going to share. I'm the co founder of uh, one of the co founders of, of, of our radio cap. Uh, the, the, the CEO of our corporation is somewhere in Bhutan right now and that's me to stand in so I usually don't do this so I ask for forgiveness uh, ahead of time our mission is to democratize uh, healthcare and and uh, bring it to a larger group of people around the world um, and um, if you don't know her uh, this is Emily Whitehead uh, she was the first patient of CAR T cell therapies uh, where uh, these leukemias can only manage be managed chronically uh, if, if uh, 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 possibly, uh, but she got cured. And I think she's going to college now. I actually met her. Uh, she's a wonderful young lady. Um, I also know another patient, a Bell Travis patient, that uh, uh, was uh, uh, a terminal uh, and then went for these CAR T cell therapies, harnessing the power of the immune system to, to uh, effectively get rid of his leukemia. And then uh, uh, right after being cured, two weeks later, he went to the Annapolis Boat Show in Bud uh, for his family. Um, that's generated a tremendous amount of, of, of energy and, and enthusiasm. And, and these therapies are like exploding. Uh, and because we're trying to translate them to uh, from liquid cancers in the blood cancers to solid tumors and autoimmune disorders. And, and uh, these uh, uh, new cellular therapies will require new diagnostic tools, as well as, as uh, uh, the ability to generate tremendous amount of data at the population level, right? Um, and so this is a, a huge opportunity. The, the, the issue that, that exists is um, these, these new immunotherapies uh, uh, have a, a tremendous amount of, 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 represent tremendous amount of change for pharmaceutical industry. If we think about pharmaceutical industry, when they uh, produce cancer drugs, like chemotherapies, for instance, what happens is they, they produce large amounts of, of those, even for the small molecule uh, therapies. And you, they, you now have to produce a, a, an individual dose of immunotherapy, taking someone's own immune cells, reprogram them, reinject them into the same patient. Pharmaceutical industry is growing thousands of people at this in a manufacturing site just because it's so manual. Um, so we, we, we're seeing that uh, there's, there's quite a bit of, of difficulty getting getting these uh, therapies to scale up. Uh, why is that? Because the interesting bit is that one person over here in the blood, if you take your blood that contains the immune, the immune cells called PBMCs, peripheral blood, mononuclear cells, these are the interesting ones that can be reprogrammed to target the cancer. Extracting them is an incredibly hard process. First of all, because there's not a lot of those in the blood, total blood volume, which is mostly composed of red blood cells and plasma. But also, extracting them and purifying them is a very manual process. So, I want to take a tube, centrifuge it, 
then they plant the pipe bed or need a syringe inside the tube, and then they have to extract those, and then they have to send them to a purification step that requires more washes, more centrifugation. That's two or three hours of time for a postdoctoral fellow in a research setting or somebody with biology degrees. It's quite expensive, and then as well as creates a lot of variability in, in the process. What we're proposing to do as step number one is to simplify these processes, completely automate them, by, by really simplifying it to a minimum. Extract blood, put it into a cassette, and you get the product that you need to start the beginning of those therapies, right? What's the product? The product is the disposable single-use cassette that is sterilizable. By the way, the processes on the previous page, they're not sterile, right? Unless you do that into a fluid. Uh, this is a patented uh, technology where all the microfluidic separation channels are on the disposable cassette. We have a, a centrifuge, which is an OEM centrifuge, which is custom designed to accommodate the cassettes and control all the fluidic uh, systems. It's uh, better, obviously, better quality, better consistency. Uh, it's faster, cheaper, and also reduces the amount of plastics uh, that, are, that are being used as part of the separation process. So it's environmentally friendly, right? There is some plastics used, but in total, when you compare the stack of tubes and pipettes and products you need to use with the cartridge that's being used here, you're really seeing a big difference, and, and it, it, it throws up in a lot of different talks, right? The interesting bit about the market, just like the, the, the painkiller that we just talked about, you apply it all over your body and then it gets a good result. Here, uh, this technology can be applied in the research market, which is low regulated. This is called GMP, right? General Manufacturing Practices, uh, or in diagnostics or therapeutics. Let's talk about these three markets. Uh, the research market, easily attainable, labs, 20 million procedures, growing mid digits, carrier. Right, it's pretty established. This is the 20 million annual procedures of the number of separation and extraction of those uh, blood cells that, that are being practiced. In diagnostics, same CAGR, same rate, but these therapies are, are very much in, in being developed, and it's the market that, that probably is going to follow and, and go along with the therapy. The therapies are the areas that are extremely, it's an explosive growth right now. Right? Because right now, those, those immunotherapies are being applied to blood cancers. When they translate to autoimmune disorders or solid tumors, the numbers explode. I'm going to take a show of hands here. Who has a family, relative, or friend affected with cancer? Okay, who doesn't? There we go. Right. So this is an area that is very powerful, touches everybody personally. And we can see that the therapeutic market and the application of these immune therapies can be extremely powerful and, and, and will be, will be uh, 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 very successful in the future. Mm -hmm. The good news is there's competition and established players. That means that this is an interesting market. If we were the only one thinking about this, I would say we're just crazy. Uh, but in this particular case, established products, those single tubes that you see here from, from uh, DD or stem cells, they have some level of innovation, some level of automation, but pretty, pretty limited. There's other uh, companies, actually, you know, the inventors of a Rotea device that ended up being bought by Thermo uh, Fisher, uh, as well as, as the Neo separators. These address different parts of the market, different volumes. They don't have a flexibility of a cost position that the, uh, the the, the system that we're proposing has here. Um, we talked to obviously uh, uh, very important KOLs across the industry, uh, the, the, the breadth in diagnostics, in research, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, these are some of the quotes of uh, uh, really radical departure from established products that, that we have. We even had one uh, prospective customer, uh, an early adopter, who told us that they would give a firstborn child if they had this product. We actually thought about it, this model. We didn't think it was a good idea, so we said, don't, don't, we'll just charge you for it. We don't ask the family member. Um, but the interesting part is it, this, this was almost like a conjoint analysis where we're able to determine that uh, Customers are willing to give about, like, to pay about $60 per separation if it could completely automate it. And they, they made the mental calculation of saying, we, we have 
uh, we invest so much labor at this, we have so much variability in the process, that we're willing to pay extra in, in this automation, and then we eliminate and we we'll repurpose the labor that we have, those postdocs and those before biology degrees, uh, lab rats, uh, uh, we'll, we'll just replace them with $60, $60 a shot uh, device. Which it, it, the other the other takeaway from this is uh, customers were really excited. Eight out of ten said that they wanted to be early adopters. When the device is ready, they want it in their labs so they can try it and they can adopt it uh, really early on. This is a projection of, of revenues. Just a, a sorry, just a quick one. Um, it, this is this is a phased entry into the markets. But what you have is, is, is the research market, is the one that has low regulation, does not require FabTech care approvals. This is, we, we believe, this is a FabTech care product um, in, in the diagnostics and therapeutic market. Uh, but we can go after the research market immediately at the beginning, right? We also refine our business model to look at some revenue growth, but also looking at, at realistic cost on, on R&D investment, sales and marketing, and, and GNA. These are, these are some refined models. And, and with the product that gross margins of about 80%, and that, that's the cost of, of the, uh, the cassette, drives that 80%, the consumable, pretty inexpensive, at volume. This is a device that's about between two and three dollars uh, a pop. Um, we still maintain very early on uh, uh, about 40% uh, EBITDA margin, which is quite attractive. Uh, and obviously, as the market takes off and moves to the, the higher regulated markets, um, the, the dynamic changes and the EBITDA increases. Exit strategies, we're looking at, at uh, distributors, looking at life science companies, looking at diagnostics companies, looking at cell therapy companies. There's a number of possibilities where this goes, depending on what drives the different market. There could be uh, an excess strategy that's multiple depending on market, it could be market dependent. So that's actually quite interesting to look at these different strategies um, and, and certainly looking at commercialization uh, uh, partners. Uh, the team besides me has, I'm going to say, we did more than 100, you know, close to 200 years of, of experience. You can see some, some of those folks that I have been uh, associated with in the past. Um, we have listed the, the companies they work for. This is an array of products in the life science uh, and pharmaceutical and, and blood transfusion and therapy industry that they work on. Um, we have a fantastic bunch of, of scientific and, and business advisors, um, including Stan Lapidus, who is fairly well known in the life science industry. And, and uh, this is a guy who invented Cologuard, uh, quite amazing uh, person. Um, and, and really a wonderful bunch of people capable of executing this product development. We're currently looking at $2 million. This is our current raise. We finished the, the first tranche. We're in the second one at a post uh, money valuation of $9, $9 million uh, with 20% safe discount. We have a rich pipeline of, of, of technologies. This is a platform that we can initially develop and base for uh, the, the, the simple box separation of cells, but we can add sample types, we can add different uh, separations. So we go direct from blood to exactly the cell type that the researchers want or the pharmaceutical industry wants. Uh, just a terrific roadmap of, um, of technology that can be uh, built upon what we have. With that, I'd like to thank you and take some questions. The first question. Huh? All right, I've been in sales my whole life, so I love, love what we were doing. I had uh, a couple questions. Uh, one was how, the where you are in development, and if you have an estimate of the cost of the machine and build those two. Okay, I'll start with that. Uh, we're currently working with partners, uh, people very well known, very established in the industry for the development of the of the cassette. Uh, this is built from start uh, with, with a, a very high volume production in mind. Um, uh, the processes, the, 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 all the intellectual property uh, is in the valve, uh, the valve design, which has to be designed for, for high volume production. Uh, that shop is in Germany um, and, and Austria, and, and we, we're working with them. So we have a first uh, a prototype that, that is coming out uh, right now. 
and we are going to integrate it into a custom built uh, uh, centrifuge, which is built uh, in, in New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. Uh, and this integration is happening this year in Q4. Uh, we'll do bench testing, uh, very basic uh, performance testing, and we're starting the blood studies next year. And you have a, it's a razor, razor blade model, right? Yes. That's, that's, and, and several models. We're looking at a subscription model, early adopter uh, for those early, uh, uh, for those ESC customers uh, to be able to subscribe to the um, uh, access to special hypercare uh, model, uh, placing the centrifuge at their site uh, and really helping develop the protocols with them so that they get the best outcome. One of the things that this technology allows to do, which the manual processes do not, is to be able to feedback data and, and really get some fine understanding of the separation process. We get the best purity product. Uh, purity by the, the, the cell uh, survive. They are pure and washed and clean, ready to go into the therapeutic for research applications. And so that early adopter model is an early subscription that, that we are discussing right now with uh, KOLs, uh, key opinion leaders. And, and um, uh, besides that, the regular razor resin blade model is exactly what we're doing after. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. That is great. Hello everyone, my name is Alan. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, just thank the Entrepreneur Center. Uh, amazing facility here at UCI. They offer a bunch of different programs for the students here. Uh, kind of bring in students who are just uh, either freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, really. It, it's all, really at all levels whenever you know students peak interest. Uh, the Entrepreneur Center brings them in and kind of guides them through that business stages. And if anyone has any questions, and Things like that. Um, so today I'm uh, introducing Broid, and uh, this will actually be my first pitch um, in front of a live audience. So bear with me. Uh, um, so cool. <laughs> so that's a good job. So Broid is in uh, AI fitness uh, and health social network. So think Instagram or Facebook, but niche specific for the fitness industry and the health industry. And so we've actually done it in a unique way to uh, produce uh, unique features for fitness and health and incorporate them in a way where we can retain user health data into our app and feed it into our AI. Um, so just a little story about me. I'm a UCI student here. I'm a biological sciences major and a social ecology major as well. I, um, uh, yeah, and then, uh, so the way I came up with the app idea is uh, I have a bunch of buddies of mine who are in the fitness industry right now, and they're IBB pros, they're bodybuilders and whatnot, and uh, they have a really hard time monetizing themselves, and, you know, they're missing out on a bunch of revenue because they can't produce their own digital online training programs, and they're missing out on a huge user base. Um, so uh, I came up with Roy. And here are some problems in the fitness industry currently. Um, so currently there's no single pl platform uh, that provides a holistic approach to the fitness industry. Uh, most, you know, uh, look at, like you have Strava, for example, they, they'll do biking and running and GPS tracking and incorporates a social network aspect of that, but it doesn't provide a holistic approach where they might include weightlifting or uh, sports such as football, baseball, basketball. Um, and it doesn't allow trainers to kind of monetize their platform on uh, within the application. Um, so all of uh, uh, so to the best of my knowledge and to the best of the people I've surveyed, uh, everyone has a fragmented experience when it comes to fitness and health because they have to use different uh, applications to kind of gauge their health. They might have a fitness tracking app uh, and then they might have a social media account where then they follow their fitness, favorite fitness influencer. 
Um, and that is, um, it, it just creates a fragmented experience and actually increases cost because if you have a subscription here and there, um, ultimately it ends up costing. Um, so the, so fitness trainers are missing out on approximately 17 billion annually um, because of the lack that they can't move digital. Um, and uh, even in scenarios like most recently, there's companies that come out as a service companies where it allows fitness trainers to launch a training program online. Um, these training programs have, it, they provide you the software, yes, but the, the users or, or the trainers aren't able to monetize themselves to uh, to their following. So you're stuck with this big funnel where you're taking your followers on this journey of, hey, come download this app or come download, um, go to our website, put in your credit card and uh, subscribe to this training program, which is not personalized at all, right? It's a generic uh, program that's just for the general public. Um, and we know in health, one size does not fit all. Um, so our solution is we, we combine everything. Uh, we have uh, over 30 data metric tracking points through our AI and um, our influencers are able to create and monetize their uh, training programs directly within our application uh, to their followers, condensing that funnel. Um, and this saves you know, users money because they don't have to have a fragmented experience where they're subscribing to multiple fitness programs or um, I mean platforms and they, they're not juggling a bunch of things at once. Um, so I, I just want to talk a little bit about our AI um, because I think it's very unique. So the way we've incorporated our AI within the application, I think is very powerful. Uh, the AI actually extrapolates the data sets into a, into a data table. And if you can imagine 30 data tables with ever expanding data points attached to them, um, the way we use that data is really unique. So me being in the health field the way I am, I work with a few doctors and uh, they actually really love the idea. So uh, we're coming up with an algorithm together to feed these data points through the algorithm and provide uh, real, I, I don't like to say we train the model, but we feed the data through the algorithm to provide real recommendations and positive recommendations. Um, Obviously, the product is scalable uh, as the fitness industry is insanely massive, and so is the health industry. Um, so some of our revenue streams include uh, training subscriptions, fitness shop, data monetization, advertising, affiliate uh, partnerships, and sponsorships. Uh, this uh, ROI is, a, is kind of a mix between technology and fitness, if you will. Uh, so you have really a hub of fitness where there hasn't ever been one before, uh, at least in a holistic approach. Um, and one way we, uh, so one way we actually retain users is through geolocation uh, notifications. So instead of um, going into the app and inputting, oh, I ate, you know, a thousand calories here and just doing the math altogether, if you were to go to in and out for example, it'll send you a notification and say, hey, we saw you went to in and out what did you order? And then you can just swipe up on that notification, type in quickly, like double, double from in and out And then it'll take that data and just save it to your profile, um, which is very unique. And uh, you know, it does it along the other data centers as well. Um, so this is the market we're in. Uh, so we have a $59 billion fitness app industry by 2027. Uh, we have a $434 billion industry, industry by 2028. And uh, our fitness trainers are currently missing out on $17 billion annually. Um, and uh, we're here to kind of fill in the gaps. Uh, this is how Roy compares to our competitors. Uh, since, I, you know, I, I haven't been able to really find a fitness application that provides a holistic approach and actually provides a marketplace for both users and content creators without, um, you know, kind of being kind of salesy, right? We're just providing an environment and that trainers are able to then 
market to their followers, but in a proper way. Um, so we have Strava, but Strava is really just focused on running and biking. Um, and then we have uh, apps like Apple Fitness and Apple Health. These are just data tracking metrics and they don't really do anything with your data besides sell it. I mean, they, they'll visualize your data, but none of us are really health professionals here. So how are you gonna interpret your own data? Um, it, it might give you an okay guide to track you know, your progress, but there's no way of interpreting that part. Uh, our growth strategy is as follows. So uh, we plan to launch a beta in October. Um, I, I'm very well connected in the fitness industry and I have a bunch of buddies of mine, like I said, that are BB pros. So um, uh, I've already talked to them and we've agreed that they bring their trainers on the app, their trainees on the app. And uh, we start with that, we gather the data, and then we expand to a launch. And then uh, we're currently working with LA Fitness uh, through through my connection with the with the fitness industry. And we plan and uh, you know the deal goes through and we get a partnership with them where their trainers use this platform directly with their uh, customers as they're signing up for the gym. Uh, in January, uh, we, we want to start selling the health data that we're collecting. Um, and uh, in April, we want to expand to uh, international. So this is some of our revenue projections. Uh, now, this is very conservative. Um, and it, it's also um, in a sense where uh, the, the average price for uh, per sale, per subscription, uh, if you do your research, it's anywhere between $50 and $300. I took the lower end of that and just said 50. And then we did that per month. And uh, we do a 10% service fee for every subscription made in the application. And then we have the fitness shop sales, uh, which we kind of did, you know, five, 50,000 users, $5, $5 per user, which is only low end for fitness products. And uh, we came up with, um, uh, the five hundred. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, ten dollars average per user, and we came up with five hundred thousand. Uh, and so, our our first year, we we anticipate five hundred seventy five thousand. Our second year would be eight point four million, and our third year would be forty. Oh. Um. So. These are the team members. Uh, Ari is a great friend of mine. He uh, actually grew up with him. Uh, he used to work for my father's tow company. And uh, he actually traveled out to North California and did uh, tech tech recruitment up there. And uh, he, since then, he's came back and uh, guided me through the flow of uh, creating the application. Um, we have Jay, he has a master's in uh, computer science in, at USC. Is also uh, assisting me with the application. And Ramon, Ramon Zambudio is a uh, securities officer uh, with the Marines. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here. First question. I'm actually a fitness trainer. And so I've seen another app try to be made in a holistic way. I have a few questions. What are the variables that will be available to the clients? And uh, your first level of clients, what I'm hearing is a fitness trainer, right? If they pay $50 per subscription, are they being no, matched that's, with, that's, yeah, that's, are they, the consumer. that's the consumer. Right? So, so the consumer purchases it and then the fitness trainers are on it and they get matched or how does that work? Right, so uh, you're a fitness trainer. Yeah. So do you come, do you have a way to monetize yourself online for me? No, well, I, fitness training is just a passion hobby. But I, right. I know a lot of people in the space, they either use my fitness pal and then they do personal training with them. And I know another app, they try to do matching fitness trainers with potential clients. And do they have their own digital training program? Yeah, they do. A lot of them do either that they collect their, all their own videos and they put it in a certain space like Google Drive. Okay. So, but the curiosity is like, what are the elements that your app will provide 
that makes it holistic and easier? Is it a combination between my fitness pal plus videos plus? So, content? so it's actually pretty unique. So in your user profile, uh, generally you have your posts and your videos, then another tab for your favorites. Instead of that tab for your favorites, it's going to be your own training program mm -hmm. that you've launched. And the way you curate this for a training program wizard, and you basically, you know, just start off from uh, week one, day one. Mm -hmm. And on this day, you're doing back and bodies, right? And so you're doing uh, bicep first work or back first workout. And then you're probably doing like uh, um, drugs. But you're doing single arm rows, right? And, and then so you take, you, you upload these videos, you just make quick few selections and you click save and then you're on to the next workout and you repeat the process. And after you finish a seven day process, you've created your training program for the month. Mm -hmm. uh, because most training programs are repetitive quite weekly. And so, yeah, that's that's how the process goes. And for any user on, on the app to find your training program, they just go to your profile, click on it, and then if they haven't subscribed to it, there'll, there'll be an authentication block. If um, if they have subscribed to it, then they'll be able to access your content, monitor, like go through the training, and then all that data that goes with the training gets fed into the AI. And so you're able to view that data as well as the trainer so that you can make well-informed decisions for your training. So does that mean the user of the app gets access when they subscribe they get access to a lot of trainers <clears throat> or like how what does it look like so it's a social network so okay. they have access to everyone um it just depends on who their favorite is and how much they want to pay and um i mean no one really has to subscribe to anyone mm -hmm. uh, you can come on the app use the ai purchase something on the fitness shop not purchase something on the fitness shop it's it, at the very core it's a community um and then from there, you know, fitness trainers are able to monetize themselves. Uh, nutrition brands are able to put their products on our nutrition shop and so on and so forth. More questions? All right, take it to me. We'll thank all of our presenters today. Let's take 60 seconds and scan the QR code over here. And let's give these guys some feedback. Okay, we can do that and then we'll wrap up for the day. Fair enough. And then the wrong answer, and then you <laughs> Today, we we'll thank all of our sponsors up here. Also, want to thank our presenters that did a great job. And we're glad to see all the interaction interactions going on as well. We'll continue that with us now. If you guys want to hang out for a few minutes to just do some networking, or we're going to walk over to the. Oh, you can walk. What? We're going to walk. Yeah, you can walk. You can walk. It's about a nine minute walk that way, according to the map. Uh, I think there's a short time you can do it. You can walk first and take a drive. I think it's too. 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 I think
I would recommend walking down the public park. Because I don't want to take my car out. That's right. And I, I think we're going to walk over to the parking lot. Parking's not bad. Parking's not that bad. Yeah, I parked at that whenever. Yeah, because it's not the school's not in session right now. It's good. It's improvement. That's right. I don't think it's that bad. Anyway. Don't look at it, you know, it's a good vote. I'm not going to vote. Thank you.